Welcome to Crosswords, the podcast about practical Christianity. What does it look like to walk in Jesus' footsteps? How do I live in a culture hostile to godliness? These are questions that we will answer as we get our minds and heart on Jesus. Good afternoon, family and friends. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon on this first day of the week. And in keeping with our theme so far, we're talking about the mighty deeds of the Lord. And this time we're going to see an event that we all are familiar with it, but we haven't really dwelled on it that much. And so we're going to see, we're going to explore a little bit this theme today as we examine God's sovereign protection amidst internal uproar. Let's first compare this to the human body. You know, the human body constantly faces threats. We don't live in a friendly world, biologically speaking. We are awesomely, fearfully, and wonderfully made, as David says in the Psalms. And God has given us an amazing multi-tiered defense system called the immune system. It has been built into our body, and it protects us even when we don't know, even when we don't realize we're constantly battling microbes and stuff and many of us have felt it this winter right when the immune system gets a little overwhelmed and we're like ah, that's when we feel a little sick but sometimes the human body attacks itself and that's a specialized situation you get betrayed by your own body and some of us have experienced that too that's the nature of autoimmune diseases like type 1 diabetes multiple sclerosis and lupus among many others. And imagine this, when the body, is its, its system is compromised, you might ask yourself the question, when our defenses are compromised, how are we going to really fight effectively? You know, likewise in the body of Christ, we face many external threats. We are a body like the body, human body, so is the body of Christ. Even the Holy Spirit taught us to make that comparison. We can stand together. God has given us the armor of God to fight the uh, powers of evil, the dark forces of evil. And we do battle against these individually and together. But what about when some of the members of the body fight evil? each other, then it looks like an autoimmune disease. When there's infighting among the brethren, how are we going to make a united stand against the forces of evil? So the saying goes, united we stand, divided we fall. Oftentimes that opposition from within can come from our own hearts. Imagine that. Your own heart is battling you. That's why Paul described the situation in Romans chapter 8 as a dual situation. You know, what am I doing? You know, one moment I want to do good, but then I realize that there's evil in me. And so that's the story of the Christian and, and, and his life as we walk this walk. But oftentimes, you know, there are times now when in the body of Christ, sometimes we might face opposition within our own ranks from our own brothers and sisters, from our own families. And so we're going to glean some wisdom today on this topic of God's divine and powerful protection with within Numbers chapter 16, as we look at and recognize three points that we can learn from these texts that we're going to examine today. We're going to recognize rebellion within. What does the spirit of rebellion look like? And how God reacts to that rebellion, the consequences of rebellious spirits. And number three, God's mercy in preserving the faithful even when this rebellion occurs. So we're going to look at Korah's rebellion. It's a text that we are all familiar with. Korah was a priest of the Lord, and he, Dathan, and Abiram rose against Moses and Aaron and challenged the authority that God had given them. Let's look at that in Numbers 16, 1 through 3. It says, Now Korah, son of Ezar, son of Kohath, son of Levi, with Dathan and Abiram, sons of Eliab, and On, son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took 250 prominent 
Israelite men who were leaders of the community and representatives in the assembly, and they rebelled against Moses. I want you to see from this text that these three guys went through the rest of the community, and not only anybody, but they specifically sought out leaders within the community who maybe wanted to side with them in this rebellion that they wanted to carry out against Moses and Aaron. And 250 of these leaders joined ranks with them, and they came up to Moses and Aaron and rebelled. Verse 3 says, They came together against Moses and Aaron and told them, You have gone too far. Everyone in the entire community is holy, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the Lord's assembly? Now, of course, if we were there, we know the end of the story. We know the story. If we could insert ourselves in that timeline, I imagine myself going up to Korah and saying, Korah, what are you talking about? Why do you think they have exalted themselves? Don't you know that Moses didn't really want to do this? Moses didn't pick this title himself. And Aaron, they didn't like put these labels on themselves and went before the community. So apparently there was like a big disconnect here that these three men sought to make this plea or this claim against God, God's established leaders. They not only question Moses' leadership and Aaron's exclusive right to the priesthood, but what they were trying to do here and saying, hey, all of the community is holy. You can see that they were trying to democratize this whole assembly together. They were trying to say, oh no, let's do this by voting. You know, nobody should have leadership or uh, a better opinion against someone else. They really thought that Moses and Aaron were forcing their opinion on, onto the entire Israelite community. That's what he thought from these words that he was bringing up. And, you know, Korah was very wise. He was a good speaker, and he probably was very keen to tap into the people's fatigue, their dissatisfaction, the general hardship that everybody was probably feeling as they were crossing this desert. Nobody was really happy. And so Korah was keen into tapping into that dissatisfaction and trying to get people on his side to fuel this rebellion. You know, there are in Internal conflicts that we've seen even in our, in our own history closer to us. I mean, this is very far removed, right, by a, quite a few thousand years. But within, when we see internal conflict within a community, uh, and, and this leads to some kind of organized rebellion that leads to chaos, confusion, this, we can then kind of relate to how the Israelites were feeling. In looking at communities that have suffered from internal rebellion, I remember the Rwandan genocide of 1994. It's a horrific example of how internal conflict within a, within a community can spiral into unimaginable chaos and confusion. And the roots of the conflict in the Rwandan conflict lay in centuries-old ethnic tensions between the Hutu and the Tutsi groups. And that was exacerbated by the Belgian colonial rule and a lot of political man manipulation. It was almost like a perfect evil storm there. But what really set it off is on April 6, 1994, there was a plane carrying the Hutu president, and it was shot down, and that sparked widespread violence. There were extremists, Hutu extremists, aided by military and government officials. They launched a systematic campaign of genocide against the Tutsis and moderate Hutus. Notice who was attacked. Everybody who they thought was against their opposition, even if they weren't really. But this is how this polarization, this political polarization, can really have a drastic and chaotic impact on a population where a lot of innocent people not only do get killed, but many others suffered. Within a hundred days, 800,000 people were massacred. Can you believe that? I mean, that was a humongous number. Entire villages were wiped out with machetes, guns, even with their bare hands. Imagine the families caught up between that chaos, torn apart, children, orphan, communities, 
shattered, ravaged by this cancer of rebellion, by people wanting to impose their own opinion and their own agenda and trying to usurp authority where it was not given. These are the results of this kind of rebellion. And we can only imagine how the Israelites felt under this kind of rebellion. We're not given that many details in this chapter 16 of Numbers, but relating to how much suffering this has caused in other communities like the Rwandan Gen Genocide. We can only imagine the kind of chaos, the frustration, the fear that these families felt, the doubt, the confusion. When God was supposed to be leading them in their presence, all of a sudden they see this chaos, this rebellion. A lot of doubt, a lot of confusion comes upon the general community. And what do you think God feels when this is happening within His own people? When His own people fail to believe that they're being led by His hand and instead try to cause confusion as to who has the right to do what within the community of the church. Korah had many ulterior motives we learn as we read through the text. Korah was a priest. I mean, he already had privileges, as Moses pointed out, when he tries to uh, react to Korah's uh, in, uh, defense or, or his claim against Moses. Moses reminded him that he is a Levite. He was already set apart for a very special service to God. And yet he was insulting that. He was throwing that back in God's face because he wanted to do his own thing. He didn't want to go along with the program. He was not content. And this is what happens when people are not content. When they refuse to be contented in God, this can lead to a spirit of rebellion. Korah wanted to be the high priest. He wanted Moses' position, but that was only reserved for Moses, uh, for Aaron and his sons. So we can see from this there were elements of covetousness and jealousy within rebellion, which is usually the case. And Korah, being a very skilled orator and manipulator, gathered 250 leaders of the community who were well respected. These were people who recognized the authority and they were willing to fall in line. However, all it took was a little push from somebody who was rebellious. All it took was a little bit of flattery a little bit of communication, a little bit of manipulation. And with their combined influence and support, they lent weight to his cause and made the rebellion much more formidable as we're going to continue reading. And so lack of contentment, lack of trust in God being the primary factor, driven by feelings of superiority, these men influenced 250 others to rebel against God's ordained. They thought things ought to go as they wanted. They had an agenda. They looked for the opportunity. They wanted to force their interpretation on everyone. They wanted their agenda to be first. These people didn't know how to be team players. They were rebels. That's what a rebel is. And because of these men, doubt, confusion, chaos was brought into the Israelite community. And because of these men, families were torn apart. People's sufferings were exacerbated. And all the Israelites had to bear the burden of the consequences that God was going to bring upon the entire community. So it's important important to recognize when discord and division are brewing within the body of Christ. We're told here in Romans 16, 17 and 18, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who create divisions and obstacles contrary to the teaching that you learned. Avoid them. We're getting very specific instructions here to avoid those who try to create divisions. He says, for such people don't serve our Lord Jesus Christ. They may be sitting here. They might say they are Christians, but they are really serving their own appetites. They're really following their own heart. They're not in keeping with God's agenda like Korah, Abiram, and Dathan. They decide Deceive. Notice what it says here. They deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. Think about those 250 community leaders that were well, well respected. Why were they well respected? Because they all worked together. They had a common good that they wanted to uh, achieve. But they 
were unsuspecting and with smooth talk and flattery, very conniving. This is exactly how the devil works himself. Smooth talk, hey, you know, flattery, trying to make you feel good, trying to appeal to your senses, to your passions. They deceive those who are unsuspecting. And that is what Korah, Dathan, and Abiram were doing. They were creating a division. They were putting obstacles in front of God's plan. God had a plan, but they had another other agenda. They didn't like God's plan. And so they wanted to usurp the authority back. They wanted to create that. And so he, Korah, and the others deceived the hearts of these unsuspecting leaders. We have to be careful, brothers and sisters, because we may have the best intentions in our heart, or we may be one of those unsuspecting. And all of a sudden we start hearing, we allow ourselves to hear trash talk Although it comes with smooth talk and flattery, it might not sound bad at the beginning, but it's trash talk, especially directed against those whom God has appointed. You have to be very careful not to get caught up in such schemes. But we have to really show where our faith is in what God's established order is. Smooth talk and flattery are the words that you're going to hear when people want their own agenda to take place and try to recruit you for their cause. Don't fall for it. Have you ever wanted to read the Bible in plain English? a language that you can actually understand and follow. Well, there is a translation like that called God's Word Translation by God's Word to the Nations Mission Society. This is the only translation of the Bible in English that follows a dynamic equivalent translation philosophy. It makes the Bible very easy to understand and it flows very naturally in the English language. You can follow along my podcast where I read to you from God's Word translation for one whole year. You can search for the podcast on Spotify or your favorite podcast reader. Search for God's Word translation by God's Word to the Nation Mission Society. You can also look it up under my name, Pedro Gelibert. They're going to say things like this. And this is probably what Korah, Dathan, and Abiram were telling these other 250 leaders. Remember, they were going through the desert. They were tired. (laughs) They were probably dissatisfied. They were not contented. They were thirsty. They were hungry. All these things. I mean, you know, you know what the Israelites went through these 40 years, right? We, We read about it. So they might say things. Hey, you know, this is Korah. Hey, you know. What do you think? Don't you, don't you feel like you've had enough here? I mean, don't you feel ignored? Don't you feel that Moses and Aaron are not really meeting your needs? Are you going to let them speak for you? Look, we're, this is a disaster. Look at us. We don't have anything to drink. We don't have anything to eat. We're disorganized. Who's leading this party? Are you really trusting that Moses and Aaron know what they're doing? You know, your situation is special. You know, come on, guys. You know, look at you. You know, your family deserves better. Don't you think that? And you can picture the other guy saying, hey, yeah, you know, my, my family deserves better. You know, what is going on here? And then the unsuspecting fall for this kind of smooth talk and flattery because they're trying to appeal to your senses here, not to your faith. They will not appeal to your faith. They won't say things like, oh man, you know, even though we're suffering and we're hungry and we're thirsty, you know, we got to trust in the Lord, right? We know that the Lord is the one guiding us. We know that the Lord is using these men to guide us through this desert. And, you know, whatever our hearts are feeling, why don't we pray together and ask the Lord to give us strength? Wow, what a different outcome it would be if that's what they were saying amongst themselves, right? But no, a rebellious person, one who incites rebellion, one who shows that his faith is not in God, is going to appeal to your senses, not to your faith. He's not going to say, let us pray together for your situation. Let us trust in the Lord. He's going to say, oh, nobody's paying attention to you. You know, your situation is special. Who who are you going to let speak for you? You're going to let these people speak on your behalf? You really think they got, they have what what it takes to lead a church? That's the talk of a rebellious person. And that's what was going on here. And it was going on in some of the churches in the New Testament. Look at what Paul says here to the Corinthians. 
He says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters. This is a strong appeal Paul was making. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when Paul says things like that, I appeal to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a big deal. That all of you agree in what you say. That there be no divisions among you. That you be united with the same understanding, with the same conviction. You know, this is only possible with the Lord Jesus Christ, which is why he was appealing to them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is a challenge to all of us here because we're all different people. We all have different mindsets. You know, we all have different doubts that come up from time to time. But when we are given the charge to be united in all we agree, that means that me, above all, me, a preacher, and some of the other preachers here, you know, we're very opinionated people, preachers and elders and leaders. And sometimes we hash it out and we get a little heated in our discussions, right? Because we're pretty opinionated. But we're given a charge here above all that we need to agree with one another in what we say. Even if I'm like, well, I'm not entirely sold on that yet, but I can see where you're coming from. So I'm going to agree with you because that's what we're told by the Spirit of God. That is maturity, brothers and sisters. That is how we present a united front against the forces of evil that want to divide us. You know what that's called? That's called consensus. Consensus is a magic word. Consensus means, and by the way, if you're married, you understand what consensus is. Because if you didn't, you wouldn't be married anymore. (laughs) Consensus means, okay, I'm not in full agreement, but I'm going to cede. I'm going to uh, be okay with that. And the other person might say, okay, we'll both cede half and half, so that we can come together and present a united front and come to a consensus. And when you read through the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, you can see that within Moses and Aaron and the rest of the leadership, they had to do a lot of that. They had to do a lot of hashing because a lot of times Moses was like, well, I don't know what, what I'm doing here. And he had to go before the Lord and they all had to come and come in agreement. We even see at one point that Moses' father-in-law tells him, Moses, you don't know what you're doing. You're going to get, you're going to get all anxious and you're going to get run down. This is what you need to do. And Moses very humbly says, you know what? That is a good idea. Let me do that. And so we see how important it is to accept different ideas at times that we might not have heard. But in the case of the leadership of a church and in the case of us being the body of Christ, most importantly of all, we have to learn to recognize what the scriptures teach and what the scriptures say is a God-appointed leader. And then go with that with a full faith in God, not faith in man. That's how we agree with one another. That's how we keep ourselves from division and rebellion within and be of the same understanding and the same thought. Because we're all human beings and we're all going to go through stuff. I'm sure Moses felt the same way that Dathan, Abiram, and Korah felt. I'm sure that he was tired. I mean, he even said it. He even went up to the Lord at times and says, Lord, you know, how am I going to do this? You know, give me the strength. I don't want to do this by myself. I mean, the one that complained most of the time was Moses. He, he, he gave his complaints to the Lord. He didn't try to tell other people about what they needed to do. So he took it to the right place. But Moses felt exactly the same way Korah, Dathan, and Abiram did. It was not unique. All right? They were not different. The difference is how we meet those needs, how we challenge those doubts that arise. The difference is that Moses and Aaron went before the Lord with these things. And Dathan, Abiram, and Korah didn't. They says, no, we're going to do it our way. And that is the difference. We need to learn how to reconcile those differences by faith learning how to be in agreement with each other and what we're convicted about. Because if we can't do this, then you're in danger of becoming a pawn of the evil forces to cause and promote rebellion and division within the ranks of God. The scriptures are very clear about how we need to deal with that. Reject a divisive person after a first and second warning. That means you don't get three strikes, you get two. And then the third one, you're out. Two warnings and then you're out. This shows us the seriousness 
of God's ideas about this rebellion and this divisiveness. He calls us to be vigilant and to safeguard the unity and the peace that he desires for his people. Look what he says through Peter here. He says, again, we see this this call, this urge to be like-minded, to be sympathetic. You know, if you're going to use your feelings... If Korah, Dathan, and Abram were, were, were using their feelings the right way, then they would be saying things like, oh man, you know, I, I understand what you're going through. I really do. You know, I feel the same way you do. Gosh, you know, we've been in this desert for a while. We're suffering here. But you know what? Let's, let's just go before the Lord with this, huh? You know, why don't we trust God and see where he's going to take us? That's the right way to use your feelings, to sympathize with the suffering that's going on. Not to try to say, oh, well, I'm sick of this and, and this is it <laughs> and I don't like this. That sounds like a three-year-old having a tantrum. You know, and that's not what we want to do, right? So Paul says, be sympathetic. That's the right way to use your feelings. Love one another. Like our brother Zach, the lesson that he brought up. Love doesn't mean I, a feeling there. Love means let me be patient. Let me be kind. All right? All the descriptors of love that we see in 1 Corinthians 13. That's what he means there. Be compassionate. Be humble. Not paying back evil for evil or insult for insult. But on the contrary, giving a blessing. Somebody comes to you complaining. You say, God bless you. You know, let, let's, let's pray for a blessing here. Somebody, just like you deal with the world, right? Somebody cuts you off in the road and you want to, ah! You, know, you, you give them a blessing, right? You pray for them that God protects them that they don't get in an accident. <laughs> that's what you should do. That's, that's what it means to give a blessing when you're given an insult. But we're talking about focus on the infighting, focusing on internal rebellion. Somebody comes to you and, and tries to step on your toes, you be forgiving. You give a blessing because that's what you were called to, as Peter reminds us here. And furthermore, Paul reminds the Colossians, you are God's chosen people. Just like Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community, they were chosen by God to get to the promised land. We're on the same trek here, except that we're not looking for a land or a city made by man. No, we're waiting for the city of God when it's finished. And Jesus is going to come back when it's all ready, and he's going to take us there. But in the meantime, we're on this trek, on this journey as God's chosen people. Holy, dearly love. And so we're called to put on compassion passion, put on kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. This was exactly the opposite of what Korah and his people brought before Moses. This is how we quell rebellion within our hearts, because you know that's where it starts. Rebellion starts in the mind and in the heart, and it starts in, in you. We all have the potential of that constantly, but we have to quell that rebellion so it doesn't be come to the forefront and now you can be used as a pawn of the devil to cause division within the body of Christ. You have to quell that within yourself and these are the ways to do that. And lastly, he says here, if anyone has a grievance... Oh, we, had, we, we can have a lot of those, don't we? When in, in marriage counseling, when people come to me, I tell them, okay, make a list of three things you would like your spouse to do for you or to stop doing. They look at me, three things? How about 25? <laughs> so no, let's focus on the top three, <laughs> okay? So we all have grievances. You know, we can all make a list of things that we would like changed. We can all do that because we're human beings, okay? But the important thing is, you know, that's not the focus here. To, f to fulfill my grievances? No, that is not the focus. It's to forgive those grievances. To do away with the list of grievances altogether. Because that comes from a place of rebellion in my heart. And that has no place in me as God's chosen one. Holy and dearly loved. Rebellion has no place in my mind or in my heart. I have to make sure I have to forgive any grievance at all because I was forgiven. And if I dare bring up a grievance against someone, I'm putting in danger the forgiveness God has given me. That is something the Lord does not tolerate. He does not handle that well. 
because he sacrifices one and only son for us precisely to forgive us. How then can I have a silly grievance? Because anything, any, anything compared to the sin that I was forgiven is a foolish grievance that I may hold against somebody else. And if you don't recognize that, then that means you need to grow in your sympathy, in your humility, and in your forgiveness to one another. That's my charge to you today if you're having trouble handling those things as you hear these words. He says here, above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. We're going to see now point number two, how God deals with rebellion. And here's the mighty deed of the Lord. Just as he finished speaking all these words, the ground beneath them split open. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed them and their households, all Korah's people, all their possessions. They went down alive into Sheol, that means the grave, with all that belonged to them. The earth closed over them and they vanished from the assembly. This is what the Lord does. He says, you have no place in my holy assembly if you're going to cause division here. That's the Lord's doing. That's what he's saying with this mighty deed. I'm sure it was quite shocking for everyone there to see what happened. Quite shocking. At their cries, all the people of Israel who were around them fled because the fear of the Lord came upon them. And they thought, the earth may swallow us too. And it was not only that the earth opened, but we read here in verse 35, fire also came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were presenting the incense. All those leaders who had rebelled, even though they were well-respected members of the community, the day they chose rebellion over faith, they were not respected by the Lord anymore. And fire came out from the Lord and consumed them. What does that picture tell us? God's mighty protection. God is zealous for his people. And he will not tolerate this kind of activity. That's what this mighty deed of God shows us. A picture, a dramatic illustration of God's response to the sin of rebellion within the ranks of his community. It shows us three things. Number one, that God takes this rebelliousness very, very seriously. The severity of this punishment, which was instant, dramatic, and unrecoverable from. There was no plea. There was no, oh, let's negotiate. There was none of that. It was done. That shows me how God views this sin of rebellion. If you like this podcast, please show your support by clicking on the support link on my Anchor FM profile. This ensures I will continue producing authentic Christian content as the Lord allows me. Thank you and have a blessed day. It's a stark reminder that while God is merciful and slow to anger, when it comes to rebellion, he is quick, he is limited, and he is ready to, ready to take it to task. Number two, it shows also, it shows me the sanctity, the holiness of God's appointed leadership. The people might have thought and might have feared Moses and Aaron for this, But Moses and Aaron knew, no, this has nothing to do with us. This is the fear of God. Don't fear Moses and Aaron. Fear the Lord. Because this happened because of the Lord. Not because Moses and Aaron were anybody special. All their specialty came from God choosing them to do a certain task. He could have chosen anybody else. But he just chose them to do this. And because the people said, I don't believe in that. Okay, well, you don't belong here. Whoop, and the ground swallowed them up. So to me, that shows, wow, whoever God appoints, that's a sanctifying thing. That's a holy thing. And yeah, he appoints people. 
Our, like our elders and our deacons, they've been appointed. And yes, they are people and yes, they are fallible. But you be very careful what you think in your mind about it because God takes it very seriously, the appointment of these things. To Him, it is a very holy thing. And your faith in God is directly reflected by how you think about that. That's a challenge to each and every one of you here. How do you think about that? is directly linked to your faith in the Lord. Because the rebellion... See, Korah thought that he was rebelling against Moses and Aaron. Guess what? God says, no, you're not. You're rebelling against me. God takes that very personally. Some of you may think, well, I don't like how the elder did this. I don't like how this deacon does that. I'm not, gonna, I'm not with them. And you might think you're rebelling against people. But if you're in the assembly of God... And you have received this blessing and your forgiveness, guess again. That's the Lord you're rebelling against. You be very careful of that little rebellion and you quash it. You have the power to quash it. Quash it before you get quashed. <laughs> That's the lesson here, right? <laughs> and number three, the way that this played out in the assembly of Israel, God is zealous for his people we can see the power of his protection over his assembly. Just like a family is very zealous for their children. Remember when my kids were little and they were playing in the playground there, I remember one time, you know, Enoch barely was able to walk and here come these kids that were a little taller than him and they and they push him. And I was about to... Things were about to get ugly right there. <laughs> I was like, I said in a loud voice, Whose parent? You know, who does this child belong to? I was about to get into it, right? So I can understand God's zeal for his children. And anybody who tries to upset that order, you're going to deal with me, says God, directly. You're going to answer to me. So I look at these three things I learned from this situation, and the fear of God is in me. And I pray that today the fear of God is in you concerning this. You know, as the Long Island Church of Christ, we're no different than probably any other church uh, on the island or in the world. We faced many threats from within throughout the years. Uh, none of those who led or incited rebellion in our past, which I can think of three or four occasions since I've been a Christian, when that has happened, when there was a Korah or a Dathan or an Abraham that poked his head up and said, well, I need, things need to get done this way. And no amount of reasoning was able to quell them. And they pushed and pushed until they were out. <laughs> None of them are here. And guess what? Wherever they went, whatever they wanted to get done, didn't get done anyway. That's the reward they got. And those who willingly became pawns of those who tried to incite were rebellion, guess what? Well, they were weeded out as well. And they're no longer here. However, there were some who were respected leaders of the community and whose eyes were, whose eyes, whose ears were tried to be used as trash pails, but they recognized it. And they confessed. And they repented before the Lord. And they are here <laughs> because of God's mercy. God is merciful and he's slow to anger. However, we must recognize from this mighty deed of God that there are grave consequences for sowing discord and division among the people of God. This is not my church. This is not the elder's church. This is the church of Christ. He bought it with his blood. You better believe he's going to take it seriously. And so that's what we need to recognize. Paul will say to the Thessalonians, if anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take note of that person. Don't associate with him so that he may be ashamed. Yet don't consider him an enemy, but warn him as a brother. These are actually instructions for disfellowship, how we don't associate with people. And the point is to make them feel ashamed. We live in a touchy-feely society. Oh, well, you don't want anybody to feel shame. You know, that's such a bad thing. Well, God says no. God's psychology is that's going to work. Who, whose psychology are you going to believe in? See, this is another point where now your belief may get challenged here. Because God uses shame for something. 
You know, we want to cover shame. God says, no, let them be ashamed because that's going to work something in them that is necessary for their salvation. You know, don't be feel sorry. You know, don't try to protect them or cuddle them or anything like that. Because when doing that, then you're not going to let God's program work. And who are we here to carry out God's program or our own program? That's part of this lesson as well. James will say it this way. He will say the wisdom from above. You want wisdom that is from God, not from the world? Well, that's a wisdom that is peace-loving. It's gentle. It's compliant, meaning We'll, we'll agree to a consensus. Compliant means, yes, let's agree together. Even if we disagree in some things, let's agree. Let's be of one mind. That's what compliant means. Full of mercy and good fruit. Unwavering. Without pretense, meaning without ulterior motives. Without other hidden agendas. That's the wisdom that comes from God. And the fruit of righteousness, meaning the fruit of doing the right thing, is sown in peace by those who cultivate peace. But when there is a rebellious person in the midst, this is hijacked, this very peace right there. And God says, you need to take him out. You need to take that person out. You need to drive him out. That is God's way of loving. Talk about tough love, huh? <laughs> Society today might say, oh, that, that's so mean. That, that's not kind. Well, again... Whose love, whose brand of love are we here promoting? The world's brand of love, which doesn't know what it's doing? Or God's brand of love, which is unto salvation? So see, all of these things really challenge our faith. Let's see how this ended. Because it didn't end pretty. Okay? It didn't end pretty. Number 16, 41 through 46. The next day, now you would think the next day, after them witnessing the ground opening up and the fire consuming people, you would think that they'd be like, Moses, Aaron, what are we going to do today? Right? I mean, that, that would have been me. Right? I don't want to see the ground opening or fire coming out of anywhere. <laughs> but no, we're, see, we're dealing with people here. <laughs> We are people, and people fail. People have to learn the hard way. The next day, the entire Israelite community complained. Wow, now all of them are complaining <laughs> against Moses and Aaron. Guys, didn't you just see what happened? What is going on? You have killed the Lord's people. When the community assembled against them, Moses and Aaron turned toward the tent of meeting and suddenly the cloud covered it and the Lord's glory appeared. Moses and Aaron went to the front of the tent of the meeting and the Lord said to Moses, get away from this community because I'm going to consume them instantly. God was like, that's it. <laughs> I'm done with these people. But wait till you see what happens. Moses said to Aaron, Take your fire pan, place from the altar in it, add incense, go quickly to the community, make atonement for them. Because wrath has come from the Lord and the plague has begun. A plague had started because these people were very obtuse and God was about to have enough with them. But guess what? The very people that they were complaining against, those very people stood the gap for them. The very people they were blaming, instead of listening to that nonsense, looked at the Lord and said, we better intercede because this community is going to come to an end if we don't. The very people that were hating them, Moses and Aaron showed them the love of God and stood the gap and made atonement for them. Isn't that the very thing Jesus did for us? I mean, when God was looking at us and saying, that's it, <laughs> I'm done with these people. The Son, the Logos, interceded and was willing to stand the gap for us. That's the beauty of the gospel. Right here, we see the gospel being played out. Aaron took his fire pan as Moses had ordered, ran into the middle of the assembly, saw that the plague had begun among the people. After he added incense, he made atonement for the people. I love verse 48. Listen to this. 
This is the peacemaker. This, these are the steps of following Jesus Christ. Verse 48. He stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was halted. That's what our Lord did for us. That's what a peacemaker does. A peacemaker will allow, he will take the hits. He's not going to take it personally. He'll take the insults that you're giving him because he knows better. He overlooks that and is looking to protect your soul and will make atonement for you by praying for you while you're insulting him. While you're calling him names behind his back, he's going to stand before the Lord and offer a prayer on your behalf to quell that rebellion in your heart. Brothers and sisters, if we all did this, if this is what we all did in our assembly, (laughs) things would be very different. (laughs) Let's strive to be this way, huh? Because God is opening so many doors for us as the Long Island Church of Christ. We know His protection is going to be with us. I don't doubt that. It's not like I'm afraid that there's going to be another rebellion. I've already been to three or four. I'm ready for the next one. I'm ready. It's just sad to see it happen. It's just troublesome to see it happen. Don't let it happen. You have the power. Quell that rebellion in your heart and trust the Lord. Don't allow yourself to be an agent of chaos and confusion. I don't really have the time. I'm running out of time. I'm not even going to get in the details and the things that I went through at Friends Academy. You've heard me tell the story quite a few times, and every time I tell you a different facet of the story, but I don't have time to say to get into that today. But I will say this. Who are you to judge another household servant? We're all household servants here. We're all servants of the Lord. Before our own Lord, we stand or fall. And Paul reassures us through the Holy Spirit, he will stand because the Lord is able to make him stand. You got something to say against the servant of God? Don't murmur about it or gossip about it. You go to that servant and tell him. And tell him with an attitude is, sorry for for judging you. I just want clarity on something. Can you quell my rebellion? Pray for me, please. Because for some reason I have this bad attitude. I don't want it in me. Are you, do you love God and honor Him to say that? If that rebellion is coming up in your heart? Because that's the right way of handling those things. It is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that can break those chains of rebellion. That can break that misjudgment. The reaction of the flesh the self-defense that you want to present. Only the gospel can break those things. Jesus became a bond servant, a slave, to set us free from that slavery of sin. He willingly became a slave to take our place so that He could set us free by the sacrifice He offered on our behalf. All that we have left to do, if you haven't done it yet, is to accept this gift and to be truly set free, to experience that freedom from the passions of your heart, that freedom from slavery. And if you realize that, if that's something that you're in agreement with, then you're ready to take that plunge into the watery grave of baptism to follow through on the law of liberty. The first step of obedience is to be baptized into the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. And now you become a fountain yourself of peace, of freedom, and under the protection of God's mighty power. So just as the body sometimes faces threats from within, our spiritual lives can also encounter those internal trials. Brothers and sisters, let's be vigilant for one another because that's part of the encouragement here. But be vigilant in you first, (laughs) in your own heart. Don't try to take the speck out of someone else's eye if you got a log in yours. Take care of that log first so that you can see clearly to take the specks out. And let's seek unity and reconciliation. Let's trust God's sovereign hand to guide us, as we talked about last week, and to protect us, as we talked about today. 
Not any person here in our assembly has been appointed God's policeman, okay? Nobody here is a policeman of anybody else. It's Jesus who's the policeman. It's the Father who's the judge. And if anything, He has appointed in the church elders and deacons to be peacekeepers, not policemen. To be peacekeepers so that we can all experience God's loving guidance and protection. If there's a prayer that you need to bring before the Lord today, a prayer of healing, a prayer of unity, a prayer of peace to yourself or someone else, maybe somebody else is trying to, to stab, take stabs at you and you, you feel those fires of rebellion coming up. Well, I urge you today to bring this prayer of healing and unity before God through our elders so that you can experience that peace again and rejoice in God's awesome power of protection. God bless you. Have a good afternoon.